thanks very much and uh, good evening. And uh, looking at the uh, program, I feel really sorry that uh, meanwhile uh, they've cooked up another program for uh, some of us and we go to meetings and decide about uh, interest rates and things like that, which are m much less interesting at the moment than many of these uh, papers. I want to talk about something which is straightforward and simple, but I do want to explain how we get to the numbers that we use on the impact of the uh, exchange rate on both output and uh, inflation. Now, I think for a long time, uh, the exchange rate didn't seem to matter very much uh, for the United States, except when it got way out of whack. And uh, that contrasts very much with what happens to uh, people who uh, live in small open economies, uh, which is what I did for eight years uh, as governor of the Bank of Israel. And in that situation, my uh, screen was open continually at the exchange rate, and there were, I was much less interested in the interest rate uh, than in the uh, exchange rate. Now, this is a problem for all small open economies, and as you know, many small open economies uh, they weren't small by the standards of what I was doing, but they're small relative to what I'm doing now. Uh, like Canada, used a monetary conditions index, which was a combination of the exchange rate, of changes in the exchange rate and changes in the interest rate uh, from a given uh, base. And if you look at those, uh, those estimates for different countries, you see that the equivalent of a one percentage point change in the interest rate uh, in terms of how much change in the exchange rate you need to be equal to the impact on the index of one percent in the interest rate, uh, that goes up with the size of the economy. So in the case of the, uh, Euro uh, of the Eurozone, uh, it takes a 6% change in the exchange rate to equal a 1% change in the interest rate. In the case of Canada, in the uh, indices they published, it took a 2% change in the exchange rate to equal the impact of a 1% uh, interest rate uh, change. Now, I'm going to talk about the United States, and uh, it's not surprising that fluctuations in the dollar have typically received much less attention here in the past uh, than they have in other countries. But it remains true that the exchange value of the dollar plays a significant role in the US economy, and it's a role that has increased over the course of time, given our growing global trade and financial linkages. I think it uh, seems like an interesting question why the U.S. economy continues to be so important in the global uh, system. In 1946 up to 1950, U.S. accounted for 50 percent of global GDP. It's sort of clear why an economy of that size would matter. Uh, now it accounts for about 22, 23 percent. I think the difference is that capital account linkages have become more and more important uh, over the course of the post-World War II period, and that the uh, capital, capital markets of the United States uh, remain uh, the most important uh, in the world. And I think it's the, the increasing importance of the capital account that balances the decline in the importance of the size in terms of goods production uh, of the uh, United States economy and with us still remain uh, the most important economy in terms of uh, for good and sometimes for bad as we've seen uh, recently. Now, um, as, uh, whoop, pressing the wrong one. As we'll see looking uh, there, 
the roughly 15 percent appreciation of the, of the dollar since July 2014 uh, is large, though not unprecedented. If you remember the uh, Plaza Agreement, you can see that was a real run-up in the uh, exchange rate, and the 15 percent that we've had uh, since uh, 2000 and, uh, 2014 uh, is much smaller than what we've seen in the past. But it's nonetheless had an important uh, influence on the United States economy. And what I'm going to do is just go through the arithmetic, and it's purely arithmetic, of uh, what impacts uh, that, has, that has had. Now, what caused the uh, rise in the dollar? Well, the U.S. economy has performed fairly well, and major foreign economies have generally performed less well and have also had uh, persistently low inflation, as we have. Because the foreign central banks responded uh, appropriately to their weakness by providing additional monetary accommodation, foreign interest rates have declined relative to U.S. interest rates, which caused foreign investors and American investors to shift into de dollar-denominated assets and boost the dollar. Uh, but that's only one, uh, one part of why the dollar ascended. The second factor has been the heightened concern about the global outlook and an associated decrease in investor risk tolerance, which are factors that tend to increase investment in dollar assets. And in recent months, investors have been particularly focused on the possibility of a slowdown in China and other emerging market economies with commodity exporters seen as particularly vulnerable in the wake of the dramatic drop in oil and non-oil commodity prices since the summer of 2014. So now what I want to do is to look at the effect of the stronger dollar on U.S. activity and inflation. And it will be convenient uh, for illustrative purposes to focus on the effects of a 10 percent appreciation that is assumed to be permanent and then draw on it uh, to calculate how much influence a 15 percent appreciation uh, would have on the economy. Now, the main way in which the uh, stronger dollar affects U.S. output is through exports. And so I'll begin by focusing on the uh, impact of the exchange rate uh, on U.S. Uh, exports. Now, clearly, uh, an, inc uh, an increase, uh, an appreciation of the currency leads uh, to a lower, uh, to lower uh, exports. And what we have in figure two, in the blue line there, is the response of U.S. real exports to a 10 percent dollar appreciation. This is derived from a large econometric model of U.S. trade. Uh, which the Fed staff maintains, and it's called the use it model. Uh, it sounds like in the sense of use it or lose it, but actually it means U.S. international transactions uh, model. And uh, this is by the staff. There's going to be an article in our international finance discussion papers, IFDP notes uh, series, in a, within a few months, and that'll provide details on the structure and estimation of the trade block of the USIT model that I'll be uh, using. Now, what that model says is that real exports uh, decline by about 3% after a year, uh, uh, after a year, and more than 7% after three years. Uh, the base for that is uh, exports amount to about 13 and a half percent of GDP of United States uh, GDP. So after three per, uh, after a year, you've got an impact of about 0.4 percent of GDP on the level of exports, uh, 
And after three years, you've got an uh, impact of about 0.9% of GDP on uh, exports. That's the blue line. So that's the amount of uh, direct losses to the economy through, export, uh, through exports. Now, when you turn to uh, imports, I have first to explain, which I didn't explain in the chart, that the 2% uh, positive on the vertical axis uh, is different than the 2% negative is quantitatively different than the 2% negative uh, on, the, uh, on the vertical axis because the uh, import number is a percentage of imports which are larger than exports so that uh, the 4% decline in, uh, in imports uh, has, uh, has a greater impact than would a 4% decline in exports on the economy. I'll come to those numbers uh, in a while. Um, the uh, important part of what uh, is seen there is that there is a, an, exp an extensive literature which has found that the degree of pass-through of exchange rate changes to U.S. import prices is low, uh, as foreign exporters prefer to keep the dollar price of the goods they sell in the U.S. market relatively constant. Uh, and there's a paper by Gita Gopinath that many of you have probably seen, which makes this point very clearly. Um, a typical estimate is that an appreciation of the dollar of 10% causes U.S. non-oil import prices to fall only about 3% after a year, and only slightly more thereafter. So the impact on prices is uh, on import prices is, is quite low. This is a factor that helps account for the more modest impact of the exchange rate uh, on exports that's shown by the red line in, uh, in figure two. Uh, and that indicates that real imports have risen by about three and three quarters percent after three years, or 0.62 percent of GDP. That's where that intersection with the uh, right-hand vertical axis uh, after 12 quarters uh, takes place. So we've got a loss of uh, exports of 0.9% of GDP after three years and uh, an increase in imports of 0.62% of GDP after three years or a change in net exports of 1.5% of GDP after three years from a 10% change uh, in, the, in the exchange rate. Now, putting that together and putting the dynamics of all that together, we get the impact of, we get the change, uh, the reduction in US GDP through the net export channels we've just discussed. And what the, uh, two curves we showed on the previous uh, chart showed is that the direct effects on GDP are that GDP falls slightly over 1.5% of GDP uh, after three years, a number which we also derived from figure two. Now, these effects take place quite slowly, uh, with over half of the adverse effects on GDP occurring after more than a year. So the pass-through, particularly on exports, is, uh, is relatively slow. Now, so that's where we are. On the assumption that there's no offset due to monetary policy easing. Uh, but in our case, in the last year, there was a uh, change in monetary policy, and I'll discuss discuss that. Uh, we need to remember this is 1.5% for 10% on the exchange rate, so it's 2.5% or actually 2.25% uh, for a 15% uh, appreciation of the exchange rate after three years. So if there were no offsetting monetary or fiscal policy actions, we'd get a decline of 2.5% uh, 
of GDP uh, after three years, and that's pretty large. It's certainly larger than what my instincts told me when uh, I started uh, started investigating uh, all these uh, numbers. So how well has this done, has this model done so far in accounting for the actual behavior of U.S. real net exports? Well, there are many factors that affect uh, trade flows, such as labor disputes at major ports, uh, as occurred earlier this year, primarily in California. Uh, but what we get uh, in practice is not that far off what the model uh, says. The, um, the model says that after a year, GDP is down by about 1%, and the data are that by our accounts, uh, just calculating from the actual behavior of net exports, that GDP fell by three quarters of a percent. So there's a substantial direct impact on GDP, particularly since we're talking about what happened within the course of just a year uh, on uh, growth. Uh, looking ahead, if we assume we're talking about something that began at the, uh, in the, towards the end of 2014, we've still got some more of that impact to come in the fourth quarter when we get the, uh, the last uh, reading on the impact of this uh, appreciation on the U.S. economy. And then, of course, we'll have significantly more uh, in uh, the next uh, two years. And everybody knows that the more export-oriented manufacturing sector has already taken a big hit during the past year and that exports have grown more slowly than the broader economy. So that's the simple story, and it's pretty simple. This is sort of stuff you could teach uh, undergraduates. Um, turning now to inflation, it's also a relatively simple story. Uh, consumer price inflation, as you all know, has been running well below the Fed's 2% target. And the exchange rate and the appreciation of the exchange rate, the strong dollar, has played an appreciable role in, uh, in this shortfall. Now, it puts the main way in which the stronger dollar depresses inflation is by putting downward pressure on import prices. And uh, we're drawing now on an eco econometric model that is discussed in a recent speech by Janet Yellen the one that she gave at Amherst uh, about a month ago, I think. Yeah? Well, nobody knows, but I think it was a month ago. Uh, to illustrate how a 10% appreciation might play through to the PCE deflator, uh, which excludes the more volatile food and energy components. What we get for prices is that um, a 10% appreciation uh, causes core PCE inflation to decline by about half a percent in the two quarters following the appreciation. That's that sharp downward, uh, downward movement. Uh, and then uh, that shock begins to wear off. By the end of the, by the, end of the year, uh, the, dollar the impact on price is about one-third of a percentage point. Uh, so 0 0.3. The core inflation rate's about 1.2, 1.3. So this would account for 0 0.3. Uh, what happened through imports accounts for about 0 0.3 uh, of a percentage point in what happened uh, to uh, core inflation. And that helps explain somewhat why we're at 1.3 and not at 1.6, 1.7. But there is a second channel through which dollar appreciation reduces inflation, and that's by increasing uh, economic slack, that is to say unemployment. Uh, greater slack amplifies the downward pressure on inflation, although given a fairly flat Phillips curve, the quantitative effect is probably fairly small. Um, 
we should recognize that uh, because the pass-through of the dollar to oil and food commodity prices is much higher than for most imports, dollar appreciation tends to depress overall PCE inflation by even more than it depresses core inflation. Now, the uh, import prices decline and then uh, the peak effect on inflation occurs within two quarters and we're at about down a third uh, by the end of the first year. So our view is that as this fades and it starts fading and is getting close to zero by the end of the second year, uh, we will have seen a, an increase in uh, inflation because uh, overall, because of the decline in uh, import prices. And as long as inflation expectations remain well anchored, uh, we believe that both core and overall inflation are likely to rise gradually towards 2% over the medium term as the labor market improves further and as the transitory effects of declines in energy and import prices dissipate. Now, in, in people's talking about all this, I'm impressed by how people say, well, we looked through the increase in the uh, price of oil in 2008, and we didn't raise the interest rate to deal with it. And so we're going to look through the impact of uh, the decline in the inflation rate as a result of decline in the price of oil. And then they proceed to talk about the 0% inflation. Well, you can't do both. If we're looking through the factors which cause the core rate to be 1.2 or 1.3 percent, uh, cause the core rate to be 1.2 or 1.3 percent while the actual rate is very close to zero, we should be looking at the core rate and not the zero. But a lot of people talk about, well, we're still at zero inflation and we're going to be stuck here forever. Actually, the impacts of energy prices feed through pretty quickly. Uh, to inflation, so we're not going to be stuck here forever. And in fact, it uh, well, if oil prices can't help themselves, uh, if oil prices can't keep going down forever, technically they can, I suppose. Uh, they could even keep going down at a constant rate forever, I assume. Uh, if they can't, uh, then we're not going to have this impact there for very long. I was had the good fortune uh, a few days ago to be speaking in an or, to an audience which included the son of Ben uh, of Herb Stein, who is the author of the expression, "If something can't go on forever, it will stop." And his son asked me, there were questions after that speech, as there are unfortunately not after this one said, well, why is the price of, uh, why is the rate of inflation so low around now? So I said, uh, I know Ben, so it was okay to tease him. I said, uh, the uh, price is, uh, is very, uh, the inflation is very low right now because the price of oil has been declining rapidly. And Ben, something that cannot go on forever will stop. And uh, so he appreciated that, I think. Um, well, let me uh, talk about monetary policy and explain why we think uh, there actually is a case to believe that monetary policy responded somewhat as it should have to the uh, decline in inflation that we got as a result of the appreciation uh, of the uh, dollar. And we do. Th I can do that by looking at uh, the famous dot plots, uh, the projections that are made in the uh, summary of economic projections, the SEP, as it's called, which tell you what the, what the uh, FOMC thought about inflation and growth in 2014, in the summer of 2014, and what they thought about inflation and growth uh, 
uh, a year and a quarter after that. So uh, more numbers, I apologize. The June 2014 survey of uh, the projections of the, star of the uh, members of the FOMC showed expectations of US GDP growth centered at about 3% for 2015, and core inflation expected to be uh, at around 1 and 3 quarter percent. And in addition, the median participant projected that the appropriate level of the exchange rate by the end of 2015 would be 1 and a quarter percent uh, before it rose to 2 and a half percent by the end of 2016. That's a year and a quarter ago. Uh, just to repeat the numbers, uh, a core inflation rate of one and three quarters percent and a projection of the uh, federal funds rate for the end of this year at one and a quarter percent. But then in the most recent uh, summary of economic projections, the SEP, following the September FOMC meeting, the median participants saw GDP growth at 2% this year, core inflation at 1.5%, and the federal funds rate below a half percent at the end of 2015, before rising to only 1.5% at the end of 2016, as opposed to the 2.5% they had seen a year and a quarter before that. Well, this just means that during the course of the time, that year and a quarter, the uh, Open Market Committee changed its mind and ended up with an, uh, with an, exchange, uh, with an interest rate uh, that was uh, essentially a full percentage point below where it was expected to be a year before. And in that sense, we were running uh, an expansionary monetary policy, or uh, we had a greater degree of monetary uh, accommodation. So uh, that was the change in policy, and that was an appropriate uh, change uh, in policy. Now, the uh, board's, board staff's general equilibrium models, because there are quite a few, that take explicit account of the ability of monetary policy to crowd in domestic demand, uh, including the staff's Ferbus model that you all know. Uh, I think Ben Friedman and I remember the days when it was called the MIT Penn Fed model, uh, and the multi-country uh, Sigma model suggests that monetary policy easing can substantially mitigate the effects of adverse shocks on GDP, including uh, from the recent run-up in the dollar. So what comes out of the Fed's general equilibrium models is very close uh, to what, uh, what happened. Um, and this means that the impact of the uh, full, uh, uh, the impact of the rise in the uh, dollar, the appreciation of the dollar, plus the offsetting monetary policy is about a half to two-thirds as large as Trade, taking trade effect, uh, taking the effects, the direct effects of only export and import reductions into account, uh, namely, it's, uh, it, it substantially, significantly uh, modifies the impact of a negative shock on the economy, and that's what happened in the past year. So let me uh, wrap up. Uh, it's clear that the appreciation of the dollar and the accompanying foreign weakness has been a sizable shock, but the U.S. economy appears to be weathering uh, those shocks reasonably well, notwithstanding their large effects on sectors, certain sectors of the economy heavily exposed to uh, international trade. Monetary policy has played a key role in achieving these outcomes, through deferring liftoff relative to what was expected a little over a year ago. Uh, the October 2015 FOMC statement indicated that it may be appropriate to raise the target rate for the federal, target range for the federal funds rate 
at our December meeting, although the outcome will depend on the committee's assessment of the progress realized and expected that has been made toward meeting our goals of maximum employment and price stability. But of course, as policymakers, we have always to be vigilant for the possibility of events unfolding differently than we expect. And we've still got another month plus of events uh, to unfold. And we have to be ready to react to the actual events and not the ones we might prefer to have, which I can sum up this whole talk uh, by saying what I learned to say in the IMF when things were going well. The IMF has a problem when it surveys a country and there's not much to complain about. What do you say? So what they say is complacency must be avoided. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>